Well, good evening. good evening. I'm kind of in the back tonight. Tonight is the celebration of the Feast of the Reformation is upon us, uh, and this night we'll begin with an opening hymn, a hymn of invoc invocation and processional cross. Uh, so at this time, I will have you turn, face the processional cross, and as it passes you, to follow it as it passes by for you. And as we sing our opening hymn this night, hymn 656, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. sins, 
O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, and to receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar, let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now continue with our psalm this evening, Psalm 46, the inspiration for our mighty fortress is our God, and we say that responsibly. God is our refuge and strength, very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way. Though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at the storm, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her; she shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage; the kingdoms totter. He utters <coughs> his voice. Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord. How he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots of fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be The Lord of hosts is with us. The God, the God of Jacob, Jacob is, is our fortress. We sing together the Kyrie.
Almighty and gracious Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us steadfast in your grace and truth. Protect and deliver us in times of temptation. Defend us against all enemies. And grant to your church your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated this night as we hear from the Word of God. Our first reading for this Feast of the Reformation comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 14, and also our sermon text for this night. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Our gradual this night, we read responsibly. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. In the city of our God. Walk about Zion, go around her, number her towers. That you may tell the next generation. Our epistle reading comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, the third chapter. Paul writes, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, No human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No. But by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks Thanks be to God. Congregation, please stand as we hear from the words of our Lord Jesus Christ this night, and as we begin by saying together the Alleluia. Alleluia, fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 8th chapter. Glory to you, Lord. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. Congregation, please be seated as we sing our sermon hymn this night, hymn 953, We All Believe in One True God.
dear saints in Christ, who fear God and give Him glory, and as you worship Him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea and the springs of water. Amen. On this Reformation Day, we hear these words again from St. John's revelation of Jesus Christ. He writes this, I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribes and languages and people. And the angel said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory. The hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. You know, every Reformation I hear those words, that text that is read, every Reformation from Revelation. And I've always kind of wondered what to make of it. It's just two verses. That was until I was reminded of a scene from J.R.R. Tolkien's series of novels, The Lord of the Rings. In Tolkien's work, if you know it, if you don't, Frodo the Hobbit is charged with destroying the Dark Lord Sauron's ring of power. His quest takes him from the peaceful rolling hills of his hometown in the Shire to the blackened volcanic waste of Sauron's domain of Mordor. It is only there where the ring was made that it can be unmade. But one cannot just simply walk into Mordor. The quest to get there is filled with all sorts of evils and horrors that truly fits the Halloween season. Their journey is fraught with external forces of race and orcs and trolls that are ripped from the darkest shadows. But the greatest challenge comes not from these external forces, but rather it comes from Sauron's one ring itself that they have to carry there. The ring has a mind of its own, And throughout the journey, the ring lures Frodo and his faithful companion, Sam, into despair. And it tempts them to cave into their desires. And should the one ring succeed and it triumph, the quest will be lost. And the lives of all the people of Middle-earth will go with it. Well, by the end of the journey, Frodo and Sam do find themselves at last in the land of Mordor. The land is unforgiving. Is harsh, and the evil presence that lurks there has a mind of its own that makes the land so foul that none can linger there. All this only further wears down the exhausted two hobbits. They have submitted already at this point to the fact that even if they succeed in their quest to destroy the One Ring, that it will still be the end and their death regardless. They don't have enough food for a return trip back home, and worse still yet, they have discovered an evil that lurks not just within the One Ring, but in everyone around them, and in themselves as well. And it causes them at this point to completely lose hope. It is until one point, when all hope seems lost and their quest seems to be at an end, when Frodo's faithful companion Sam one night, looks up into the sky and through a little blank space in the clouds, sees a star, a lone single star, secure and high above in the heavens, a solitary shaft that just twinkles there in the night sky. And as Sam stares at it, Tolkien writes this, and it just fits perfectly with the text. The beauty of that one star smote Sam's heart as he looked up out of the forsaken land that he was in, Hope returned to him. For just like the star that was clear and cold, the thought pierced Sam's mind that in the end, the shadow was only a small and passing thing. There was light, there was beauty, forever beyond evil's reach. That lone star and all of its beauty pierces through the veil of evil and death in Tolkien's book And is a reminder that while evil seems to avail all around us, and that we seem to be mired in the muck of sin and in the shadow of death, that we need to remember that evil is both limited and it's faltering. There is good that is beyond the reach of evil. There is beauty, there is truth that remains forever outside of the corrupting power of sin and death. And so... 
it is in our reading from Revelation. High above the earth, we see not a star, but an angel flying overhead. And the message of the angel carries a message of an eternal gospel. It is eternal because you can't touch it. It's eternal because you cannot change it. It is eternal because there is no attack upon it that will change or alter what Christ has done and has triumphed. The gospel is forever secure, and it is the reason for that is because of Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is now beyond the reach of evil, and he sits at God's right hand on high. No matter what you do or who you are, the eternal gospel lies outside of any corruption. Though, as we read earlier, the nations rage, though the devil wars against it, though even sometimes our own wills may even resist it, the gospel of Jesus Christ sallies forward throughout all times to every nation, to every tribe and language and people. The gospel of Jesus Christ, of his triumph over sin, over death, over hell, over the grave itself, is secure. And all of that, which we now endure, everything that we experience now, is no more than a passing shadow. The light that beams down from heaven, the glory of the crucified and risen Son of God, the Lamb of God, will always shine through. That is the victory and the message that we have gathered to hear, to receive, and to praise God for again this night. The victory of Christ that mocks and scorns every attempt of the devil, of unbelievers who hate God and his people, but can do nothing to change the atonement for sin that has been wrought by Jesus Christ himself. That is the truth of the Lutheran Church, and it is the victory that we ourselves cling to because it is the good that cannot be corrupted There have been attempts, of course, to destroy this eternal gospel, but all have failed. But that hasn't stopped evil to try and undo it anyway. Just ask the first Christians, those few in those early centuries who felt temptation sting to abandon the gospel when Rome and her emperor murdered and killed them for not bowing down to the demands to fear and worship imperial Rome and give Caesar glory. They knew better. Instead, it was the blood of the martyrs in Roman Colosseums and in jails that sealed and seeded the witness for future generations that the gospel will triumph in the end. And indeed, now that the Roman Empire is indeed in ashes, There is one name whose name is eternal, the Lord Jesus Christ. In the seventh centuries and following, while Islam was spreading throughout much of what had been Christian lands by use of the sword, they tried to replace the message of an eternal gospel with a lie, a lie that stated that the cross was a fraud and the Lord Christ was nothing but a mere messenger and a long line of messengers that were really pointing to the revelation that now Muhammad was giving a message that is spread still today by violence and mankind's efforts to ascend to God by piety and purity of devotion and not by the death and resurrection of Christ. But they fail, and they will continue to fail because Christ is Lord, and he is beyond their reach to change. The cry indeed still goes out, now and forevermore, of an eternal gospel that today is now gripping the heart of Muslim lands the world over, about the Lord Jesus who loves those that many in those places consider to be weak and disposable, often women, the sick, the untouchable, but who instead Christ calls as valuable and loved and forgiven. It is this eternal gospel that has even weathered the abuses of the church herself, a church that throughout history would eventually, and still today, elevates the office of the papacy in ways that puts a man on par with Jesus Christ himself, and in ways that we would say is blasphemous of an office that claims it can declare new teachings 
and doctrine of the church that conflicts with the faith once for all delivered to the saints. But it is this eternal gospel, the call of Jesus Christ to faith and his shed blood on the cross and the atonement that he won that caused many to see through such lies and abuses of the spiritual Rome. And though they would be mocked and condemned, these believers would even be demarked as Lutherans, who stood firm and still today gather in that lineage as we do and in that truth. And as the eternal gospel we hold now is finding homes in what was once called the third world, while places in America and Europe wane. Speaking of us, what should we say concerning our day? The eternal gospel still shines forth amid the apathy and the indifference of our own context. Amid our context, it is so often reducing the gospel into psychological methods and guides for better living. Still the angel and the preachers of the gospel give us that same message, a message of a gospel that can't be destroyed and won't be ignored and will save those who rally to the call of Jesus Christ and forever doom those who shun it. That eternal gospel that has striven with men throughout all ages is what we here at Christ Lutheran Church hold to and proclaim. There is much that we must contend with if we are to stick to that proclamation. There is indeed false doctrine and evil living that at times seems to swallow us up whole, but there is still yet that eternal light. We must be on our guard, be vigilant against the tendency at times to see the mission of the church as a survival of the bureaucracy and of man-made traditions, forgetting that these are fleeting and they too will be swept away in the end. Or the threat of our context that sees the sacraments which we partake of tonight not as life-giving tethers of the eternal gospel, but oftentimes are taught and admonished in the American context as a false and dying way, which is that baptism and the Lord's Supper are mere symbols of ways that we are to be obedient. But no matter, despite it all, the eternal gospel goes forth. While we might be here and gone tomorrow, the gospel won't. Christ is crucified. Christ is risen. Christ is ascended and he's going to come back. So, you saints here today, fear God. Give him glory. The hour of his judgment is indeed nigh. And the gospel that we hold on to, that eternal gospel, is that when that judgment approaches you, indeed it does at this table tonight, you will find that you are covered in the righteousness of Christ, and grace will be shown you, despite your and mine many sins, and our frequent failings, because the gospel is eternal. You can't touch it, and you can't alter what his son Jesus has done for you by his death and resurrection. You are good with God, because Christ and what he has done. And this is for people of all nations, of all languages, and of all tribes. And therefore, while you can't touch the gospel or alter it, it is for you. Christ is for you. That is the truth of the Reformation. It is not a new truth. It's not 504 years old. It's God's eternal truth. An eternal gospel that we cling to and has been clung to by every generation of Christians prior to us and God grant it to the ones who come after us. It is to this gospel that we must return to as always as a church, especially before it is too late, and if we are to survive the fleeting shadows that are coming. This is the eternal gospel that will triumph in the end, when all sin and death is finally done away with at the end of all things. So dear brothers and sisters, made so by the blood of Jesus Christ, continue to hear, continue to receive the eternal gospel that has been proclaimed to you again and again to all who dwell on the earth. Christ is Lord. He is living. Alleluia and amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit are with you always. Amen.
Let us now turn. At the end of our catechism, after the six chief parts of the table of duties and the prayers, is the Christian questions with their answers. This night we'll be saying these together. You can remain seated because there's actually several questions. And as each you'll respond to me as you prepare to receive the Lord's Supper these not this night, these are questions we should always be asking ourselves. And here's how they go. After confession and instruction in the Ten Commandments, the Creed, the Lord's Prayer, and the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, the pastor may ask, or Christians may ask themselves, these questions. One, do you believe that you are a sinner? Yes. How do you know this? Are you sorry for your sins? Yes. What have you deserved from God because of your sins? His wrath, His blood, temporal death, and eternal Do you hope to be saved? Yes, yes that is, is my hope. hope. And whom then do you trust? My dear Lord Jesus Christ. Who is Christ? The Son of God, who is God and Lord. How many gods are there? Only one. But there are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What has Christ done for you that you trust in Him? He died for me and shed His blood for me on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. Did the Father also die for you? He did not. The Father is God only, as is the Holy Spirit. But the Son is both true God and true man. He died for me and shed his blood for me. How do you know this? From the Holy Gospel, from the words instituting the sacrament, and by his body and blood given me as a pledge in the sacrament. What are the words of institution? Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Do you believe, then, that the true body and blood of Christ are in the sacrament? Yes, I believe. What convinces you of this, to believe this? The word. What should we do when we eat his body and drink his blood, and in his way receive his pledge? We should remember and proclaim his death and the shedding of his blood, as he taught us. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Why should we remember and proclaim his death? First, we remember the creature make satisfaction for our sins. Only Christ, true God and man, could do that. Second, so we may learn to be horrified by our sins and to regard them as very serious. Third, so we may find joy and comfort in Christ alone and through faith in him be saved. What motivated Christ to die and make full payment for your sins? Father, and for me and other sinners, as it is written in John 14, Romans 5, Galatians 2, and Ephesians 5. Finally, why do you wish to go to the sacrament? That I may learn to believe that Christ, out of great love, died for my sin, and also learn from him to love God and my neighbor. What should admonish and encourage a Christian to receive the sacrament frequently? 
first both the command and the promise of Christ the Lord, second, his own pressing need, because of which the command, encouragement, and promise are given. But what should you do if you are not aware of this need and have no hunger and thirst for the sacrament? To such a person, no better advice can be given than this. First, he should touch his body to see if he still has flesh and blood. Then he should believe what the scriptures say of it in Galatians 5 and Romans 7. Second, he should look around to see whether he is still in the world and remember that there will be no lack of sin and trouble. As the scriptures say in John 15 and 16, and in 1 John 2 and 5. Third, he will certainly have the devil also around him, who with his lying and murdering day and night will let him have no peace within or without, as the scriptures picture him in John 8 and 16, 1 Peter 5, Ephesians 6, and 2 Timothy 2. Note, these questions and answers are no child's play, but are drawn up with great earnestness of purpose by the venerable and devout Dr. Luther for both young and old. Let each one pay attention and consider it a serious matter. For St. Paul writes to the Galatians in chapter 6, Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Please stand as we now continue with our prayers this day, beseeching God would be with us and for all the people of the earth for whatever the need may be. Almighty God, we give thanks for all of your goodness and bless you with the love that sustains us from day to day. We praise you for the gift of your Son, our Savior, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, for your Holy Church, for the means of grace, for the lives of all faithful and just people, and for the hope of the life to come. Help us to treasure in our hearts all that you have done for us, and enable us to show our thankfulness in lives that are wholly given to your service. Lord, in your mercy, save and defend your whole church, purchased with the precious blood of Christ. Strengthen your faithful people through the word and the holy sacraments, making them perfect in love and in all good works, and establishing in them the faith once delivered to the saints. Lord, in your mercy, grant your wisdom and heavenly grace to all pastors, and to those who hold office in your church, that by their devoted service, faith may abound and your kingdom increase. Lord, in your mercy, send the light of your truth into all the earth. Raise up faithful servants of Christ to advance the gospel both at home and in distant lands. Lord, in your mercy, in your mercy, strengthen newly established congregations. Support them in challenging times. Make them steadfast, abounding in the work of the Lord, and let their faith and zeal for the gospel refresh and renew the witness of your people everywhere. Lord, in your mercy, preserve our nation in justice and honor, that we may lead a peaceable life with integrity. Grant health and favor to all who bear office in our land, especially the President, our President Joe, and Congress of the United States, our Governor Tony, and the legislature of the state of Wisconsin, and to all who make, administer, and judge our laws. Help them to serve this people according to your holy will. Lord, in your mercy, take from us all hatred and prejudice. Give us the spirit of love and order our days in your peace. Prosper the labor of those who work to bring peace and justice to the nations of the world, that mutual understanding and common endeavor may be increased among us all. Lord, in your mercy, Bless the schools of the church and all colleges, universities, and centers of research, and those who teach and work in them. Grant your wisdom in such measure that people may serve you honorably in church and in state, and that our common life may be conformed to the ways of your truth. Lord, in your mercy, make holy our homes with your presence. Bless them with joy. Keep our children in the covenant of their baptism 
Enable their parents to bring them up in lives of faith and devotion. Unite the members of all families in a spirit of affection and service, that they may show your praise in our land and in all the world. Lord, in your mercy. Let your blessing remain upon the seed time, and especially now in the harvest, the commerce and the industry, the leisure and rest, the arts and culture of our people. Take under your special protection those whose work is difficult or dangerous, and be with all who put their hands to any useful task. Give them the just rewards for their labor, and the knowledge that their work is a blessing in your sight. Lord, in your mercy. By your word and spirit, comfort all who are in sorrow and need, sickness or adversity. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, all these things, whatever else that you know that we need, we ask you grant to us, Father, only for the sake of him who died and rose again, and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We remain standing as we sing the doxology for our offertory and as we present before God those gifts which we present now to him. Bless the Lord. Thanks. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. We now sing our closing hymn this night, hymn 645, Built on the Rock. Amen. 